this workshop is a collaboration between Ofi's work and the University of Göttingen's um, work, with, which is led by Stefan Klassen, and so we're co-hosting this workshop. And our aim together was to really look at why monetary poverty measures required, or whether they required, um, a complement um, in a multidimensional poverty measure. To put it very starkly, if, as in the case of Nigeria, we find by the $1.25 a day measure two-thirds of the people are poor, and if we also then do a, a multidimensional poverty and find that two-thirds of the people are poor, two-thirds of people in Nigeria are multidimensionally poor, then the question is, are they the same people? Because if they are, then multidimensional poverty measures are not adding anything to income poverty in terms of identifying who is poor. They still tell us how these people are poor, which income does not. But perhaps as a headline measure, we don't need them. And so that really, that curiosity about how monetary and multidimensional poverty relate was our motivation for this workshop. So what we did here was we took uh, data sets that had information on both monetary poverty, either consumption or expenditure, and multidimensional poverty with different definitions, but they came from the same survey instrument. So we could see if the same person or the same household would be called income poor, consumption poor, and whether they would be called multidimensionally poor. And so the papers for this workshop, um, the workshop has 17 papers, 13 of them are on this topic, two are methodological, and two look at innovations in income or, or monetary poverty measurement. And we cover 11 countries. We have two papers each on India and Nepal. We cover 39 time periods. And half of the papers have more or less a income-free multidimensional poverty index, which roughly matches the global MPI, which OFI produces, and uh, together with the UNDP Human Development Report Office, and which is annually released by that office. And seven of the papers have done very different definitions of multidimensional poverty, because again, we wanted to look at play, um, and so they've added work or they've added um, uh, informal employment or other dimensions to their measure. Um, and each of the papers then have done a set of, of consistent analyses across them. So the findings for, from this body of papers, and these are first drafts, um, first presentations of first drafts. We've gotten a lot of comments, and so the papers will be re revised. But I think to all of us, they've been a bit startling. Some of the things that came up we expected to find, but seeing them in black and white um, still has a bit of a, uh, an interest factor. And some of them we genuinely did not expect. So I think four findings um, I, we are definitely going to look into further. One is the rural versus the urban poverty. This is difficult to measure with monetary poverty measures because we need to adjust the prices. And so it's difficult to know if the adjustments are accurate in objective terms. Um, and so what each paper did, which was possible, when, when this was possible, was to compare the rural and urban poverty measures for the monetary measure and for multidimensional. And in all cases, when we were able to do this, we saw that the levels of poverty in rural areas were higher by a multidimensional poverty than by an uh, income or consumption poverty index. Um, two and a half to three times more people, sometimes four times more people, are poor in rural areas. These are by directly comparable measures. This raises questions we did not try to answer about whether our measures are accurate, whether we need different indicators of land and livestock in rural areas, of overcrowding, waste disposal, violence in urban areas. Um, but at least we are putting onto the map of poverty studies you know, a data point that with these objectively uh, uh, identical indicators, these are the relative levels of poverty. A second finding had to do with household size. And um, in income or monetary poverty measures, often um, we simply use the number of people in the household, whether they're babies, grannies, or, or adults. Um, sometimes we use equivalent scales for national poverty measures in monetary sense. Um, and so we looked at multidimensional and monetary poverty uh, by household size. And it does vary. It varies across rural and urban areas. It varies across countries and definitions of both monetary and multidimensional poverty. But a general finding um, in a number of cases is that household size matters a lot less for multidimensional poverty measures than for income. 
and that in income or monetary poverty measures, high household size is associated with high poverty. But that is not necessarily the case in multidimensional poverty measures. Um, so we need to explore that a lot further, um, look at that by ethnic group, by uh, household composition in terms of the age of populations, dependency ratios. Um, but that is another finding. The third, I think, um, is a detective story, and we really look forward to having some insights we don't yet have. But we looked, for everybody who is multidimensionally poor, we looked at their income or their consumption, and we said, really, what group do they belong to in the whole distribution? And what we found in every single country was that in the richest 20%, the richest 20% of a society by some monetary measure, some people were multidimensionally poor. 5.5% um, in Vietnam, 6.5% um, up to higher numbers in rural India. Um, and so that really raises questions. Who are these people who have high incomes but multidimensional poverty? Are they ascetics? Are they people who have addiction problems? Are there data errors in their surveys? Really, this is a big puzzle for us, and we don't know uh, if it is highlighting some measurement errors or if it's a highlighting a real disjuncture between the signals we're getting from these different measurements. And the final finding, in a sense, we already knew from the literature, but we're nailing it down and now in a different way. We already knew from the literature, both in Europe and in developing countries, that the overlaps between a monetary measure and other deprivations like malnutrition or even asset index deprivation are much less perfect than um, has often been as assumed. But now we are seeing this in black and white. So in Indonesia, when roughly 16.7% of people are poor, only 7.1% are both multidimensionally poor and income poor. In Vietnam, it's even less. It's 5.7. So basically, one-third of the people, when 17% of the population are poor, one-third of them are both income poor and multidimensionally poor. And we would have expected them if we had a headline that 16%, 17% of your people are poor in income and 17% are multidimensionally poor, they would be the same. But we're finding that they're not. And we're also finding that among the more extreme poor, as that goes down to 10%, you would think that then the match would be better. But we're not necessarily finding that. So we are finding that there is a value, broadly speaking, in measuring multidimensional and income poverty. Um, even if the headline figures are the same, they are identifying different households. We don't yet understand um, all of these differences. And in, in addition to the studies that we are doing here, we'll need qualitative work, anthropological work, and talks with policymakers to really unravel this mystery. But at least it's, it's a first step in, in that direction. So a very common question in poverty reduction is, we've had a lot of growth. How has that impacted income poverty? And a number of the countries that we have studied have had tremendous success stories. Vietnam, um, Venezuela, um, Peru, all of these have had economic booms, Indonesia. All of them have had strong growth and in some periods and in the relevant periods for our studies. And they have had strong reductions of income poverty. And so one of the puzzles that we've done in the dynamic studies has been to say, has multidimensional poverty gone down as well? Has it gone down as quickly? Um, has it gone down for the same populations? Is there a lagged relationship? Does it go down but maybe a few years later? Um, and so we will be having a set of, of studies which show the relative rates of decline of mo monetary and multidimensional poverty. We'll also be looking at the growth elasticities, to what extent economic growth drives reduction in these different kinds of poverty. Um, and so that's one set of policy recommendations, are the kinds of growth and policies that will have the highest impact on different definitions of poverty, all of which, in my view, are important. And another set of uh, policy implications relate to targeting and tracking poverty over time. If, as we seem to be finding, that there are differences that come into play when you have multidimensional poverty measures versus uh, monetary ones, 
then it does mean that um, looking at levels um, requires both measures. Uh, and it also means that if you are targeting uh, particular households for benefits, conditional cash transfers or some government service, you may need to look not only at proxy means tests to target the income poor, but also look at a more direct um, poverty measure. There was one very interesting paper in our, in our study which did poverty mapping in uh, Uganda using census data and found that the multidimensional poverty map where the multidimensional poverty measure is directly calculated from the census data differs from the income poverty map. And so even if there's geographical targeting of government services, identifying which geographic areas, villages, or districts have the highest poverty may depend on how you define poverty. And so having two measures up and running might lead to a, a more accurate distribution of resources. And I think the big policy value of a multidimensional poverty index is that it shows the composition of poverty and how this changes across ethnic groups, across regions, um, across different kinds of households. And so a lot of the, the policy energy of this has been really to look at um, the interventions that could be done by public policies that would directly target deprivations that would in the next period of measurement be seen in a reduction in multidimensional poverty. And that has been the experience of Colombia, the government, um, and somebody from there is in this workshop and has been describing some of their experiences as well as other, other countries using this work. Um, so I guess I would leave it at that. I think the other very, very important set of studies which are coming out in uh, three papers in this workshop, we have panel data. So we track the same people over time, over 10 years of their life, uh, the same households, and we are able from those studies to identify those households that fell into poverty, those that were poor and then moved out of poverty, and those that have stayed in poverty the whole time. And we're able to really see what are the caustic combinations of deprivations that trap people in multidimensional poverty across periods. And what are those deprivations that if they are removed, people can move out of poverty, even given the other deprivations that they have. And I expect that as we do more of these chronic panel data studies, that we'll have a lot of policy insights into the sequencing of policies that has the biggest impact on multidimensional poverty.